Uh, this is the title of my talk. Uh, why chess is the wrong metaphor for international relations, why Jackson Pollock is a better but still an adequate metaphor, and why this has profound political implications. Uh, I work in the world of diplomacy and international relations. I was a British or scholarly books about uh, international relations theory. But I want to, to suggest to you today that this is not the right metaphor for international relations. That there is no order, at least not the order that conventional diplomats and analysts uh, would have you believe. Instead, this, the world that we see more accurately resembles this, uh, Jackson Pollock painting. Metaphors matter, or, or rather it matters how we think about the world. Because using the wrong metaphor, a chessboard, rather than a Jackson Pollock painting, can have very unpredictable and even dangerous consequences. And if Jackson Pollock is the right metaphor, then this has very dramatic consequences about how we should engage with the world. When I was a diplomat for a state, Britain, I really believed in the order of things, uh, that states were the primary unit of international interaction, that they interacted according to things like security and trade, what are called national interests. I worked at the UN Security Council, which offers itself as a kind of guardian of this order, set up by states after the Second World War to stop conflict between states. The aesthetics of this place, uh, neat cynical, reinforce this sense of orderliness. In this place, my job was to negotiate resolutions about complicated places far away, to show the world that it was manageable, that we were in control of the chessboard. But the longer I worked in this tidy place, the more it seemed that instead of order, our work there might be producing or helping produce the opposite. I worked on Iraq and the Middle East. I was called the UK's expert. I thought that I understood these places. My government encouraged that belief. We understood. We were in control. But what happened one infamous September day, and then subsequently, made me realize that things were much, much more complicated than any of us had understood. Who would have believed that this man, this man's rage, in part over Russia's oppressive war here in Chechnya, would inspire him to join a terrorist group formed by the wealthy son of this man, a building magnate in Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden himself was inspired to take military action by the Soviet occupation of, of Afghanistan, the defeat of which helped bring about the end of communism in Europe and the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. Who would have predicted that Muhammad Atta's horrible act on September the 11th would bring about the invasion of Iraq, even though the regime in Iraq and Al-Qaeda had nothing whatsoever to do with each other. The planners of that invasion planned that the Saddam regime would be toppled like the Black King on the chessboard Triggering, triggering a new era of stability and democracy in the Middle East, like dominoes toppling another gay metaphor. But who would have predicted 
what happened next, for it surprised everyone. Did anybody foresee that one consequence of the invasion would be that Iraq would be separated de facto, if not legally, between a Kurdish north and a Shia-dominated south? Who would have believed that one of the principal beneficiaries, perhaps the main beneficiary of the invasion, was, the, or was Iran of the Ayatollahs? Who would have predicted that one consequence of the invasion would be the end of Christianity in Iraq? Because the Christian community, sadly, have all but left that country, driven out by discrimination and sectarian violence. And even this account, of course, is a grossly simplified story of what took place. One tangled thread in the narrative, one spatter of paint across the canvas. It's very easy to say they should have known. I was Britain's Iraq expert at the UN Security Council. I did not foresee all of this. Nobody did, not even the greatest experts. This is not to score an easy political point about the hubris of the neocons, but to suggest instead that governments do not, and maybe cannot, understand this complexity. Governments are too simple. They are too required to simplify. And their attempts to impose simplicity upon complexity will have unpredictable, if not dangerous, consequences. The world is not, in short, a chessboard. However much governments may pretend otherwise, however much we may wish to believe them, it is something else. Not chaos, but not order. Instead, a constantly changing mesh of billions upon billions of interactions, some insignificant, some insignificant, some of great consequence, like Muhammad Atta's fateful course. The world is vastly more connected between companies, groups, and individuals, connected by trade, tourism, mass migration, or Facebook, much more connected than the state-based system, the chess, book, the chess board can describe or accommodate, and it's becoming more connected and faster all the time, so that even the Pollock image is inadequate to describe its complexity and its dynamic nature. What does this mean? What does this mean for all of us? One thing is that we should demand that the state-based system take some account of this new reality. Back here at the UN Security Council, it turns out that fully 80% of the conflicts on the Council's agenda are about conflicts inside, not between states, involving so-called non-state actors, guerrilla groups, separatists, oppressed minorities. Wouldn't it make sense for the Security Council to talk to these people, to listen to their views, instead of ignoring them? as they currently do, and they ignore them precisely because they are not states. Another response is psychological. How we respond, how we think about this. When governments offer us simplistic narratives of how their policy A will lead to outcome B, we should be skeptical. We should demand more detail, more complexity, more honesty, and perhaps more humility about how the world really works. But one last, rather more radical response also suggests itself. However much that states may claim to be in control, they are not. The evidence is mounted that confronting problems of global origin, be they climate change, terrorism, or even economic volatility, states and states are less and less able to find effective solutions. Traditionally, we think that it's for the diplomats to deal with this stuff. But in fact, it is all of our business if we are to produce lasting effects. In other words, we have to act ourselves to produce political results, not campaign for our governments or others to do it. We're so used to a detached model of political action 
donate to my campaign, click here to sign the internet petition, that we've forgotten that it is action that produces political effects. In the 1930s, people who were worried about the spread of fascism in Europe didn't write to their congressman, didn't sign a petition. Instead, they travelled to Spain, fought in the trenches. Some of them lost everything. Some of them had the most powerful experience of their lives. One suspects a richer experience than merely signing a petition. It's not for me to prescribe what you might do, but to offer my own experience. I would suggest that you follow what makes you most angry. For anger, as much as inspiration, will give you the fuel to keep going. When I, oh, that's not being wrong me. When I resigned from the British Foreign Service over the Iraq War, I was so angry and frankly so disgusted by the unjust and frankly stupid way that diplomacy is currently run, that I set up, set up independent diplomat to get the marginalised countries and groups into the room where their futures were being discussed. Another lesson is find others of like mind, for you will find others who are angry too. My colleagues and independent diplomat, diplomat keep me going, because without them, I suspect I would have given up long ago. We work every day to get governments and marginalised groups into these negotiations so that at last these negotiations might take some account of their local reality, of their complex truth. This illustrates another lesson. Do, don't, talk or tweet. Show, don't tell. This slide rather contradicts itself. Uh, but most importantly, Alexander the Great thought that when confronting your enemy, you should always attack him at the strongest point. Because if you succeeded there, the enemy would collapse completely. And this returns us to another, or to an imperfect and unloved metaphor. The world is not simple, but to be effective, you need to direct your action at the main target. I would suggest where the suffering is greatest because there you can make the greatest difference. Don't be satisfied with messing around with elegant call play or a neat move by your bishop. In chess, there is only one objective, which is to kill the king.